For most athletes who compete in the Olympics, it's the culmination of a lifetime of hard work and dedication. However, there are many crazy stories of Olympians who've had victory snatched from their grasp amid shocking circumstances. Here are the times athletes were stripped of their Olympic medals. In 2017, NBC Sports reported that 18 Russian medalists from the 2008 and 2012 Olympics had been disqualified for their association with doping scandals, and an additional 10 had their medals stripped because they had been on a team where at least one of the members had been caught doping. They were told to return their medals to the International Olympic Committee and promptly said, nope. Some said more than that. Maxim Dildin was disqualified from the relay in order to give his bronze medal back, to which he replied, I've got the medal at home, let them try to take it. That was in February, and by August, there were still clear holdouts. Reuters reported that among them was sprinter Tatiana Firova, who explained, I don't want to return my medals because I think no one would have deserved them more. That was, of course, in spite of testing positive for steroid use. When the media looked at whether or not the IOC could force them to give back the medals, the answer from experts and historians was pretty much, we don't know. The IOC, meanwhile, has been a bit mum of what they've actually gotten back. Romanian gymnast Andrea Radican won a gold at the 2000 Olympics for the individual all-around competition, and then it was almost immediately taken away. The reason was doping, but according to the New York Times, it's complicated. The then 16-year-old Radican tested positive for pseudoephedrine, which while being on the IOC's official list of banned substances, is probably also in the medicine cabinets of most homes. It's an over-the-counter cold medicine, and that's exactly what she'd taken. Not only had she taken it, but it was her trainer who gave her the meds to fight off flu symptoms. Radican appealed the decision, while the International Court of Arbitration for Sport agreed that she hadn't gained any advantage from taking the medicine, they also argued that anti-doping rules, quote, must be enforced without compromise. Not only did they refuse to return her medal and title, but her doctor was banned from the remainder of the games, as well as the next two games. Radican later said, I am disappointed. It's not for me to judge the decision, but I am convinced, and my heart is at peace that I did everything right and competed fairly. In 2019, a film called The Golden Girl followed Radakan's journey for redemption. Having gone on to become a journalist and sports announcer, she says that having all she'd worked for taken away because of a technicality means there's no chance of fairness with the IOC. Saying Usain Bolt is fast is the understatement of the year, and he famously has a ton of Olympic medals to prove it. But he'll always know that he should have had one more. In 2008, his team took the gold in the 4x100 meter relay. Then they had to give it right back. At first, everything looked on the up and up. However, when Bolt's teammate Nesta Carter was retested for doping, the results came back positive for one of the stimulants on the IOC's no-fly list. The retesting was done after officials realized just how far Russia's doping scandal reached. That said, the Jamaican relay team sort of got caught in the fallout. Weirdly, retests aren't entirely unheard of, and urine samples from athletes are often saved in case of the development of new, more precise technologies that can be used to detect illicit substances. Bolt was, predictably, not thrilled about the whole team losing their medals because of one person. He told NBC Sports, I'm not happy about it, but it's just one of those things that happen in life. But I can't allow that to deter me from my focus this season, so I am focused, but I am not pleased about the situation. It wasn't until 2010 that Chinese gymnast Deng Fo Shao had the bronze medal she'd won in the 2000 Sydney Olympics taken away, and according to the Wall Street Journal, it's entirely possible that it was only because of her own oopsie. When registering for the 2000 Olympics, they note that she had applied with a birth date of January 20th, 1983. That would have made her 17 years old at the time of the competition, a year over the minimum age requirement of 16. But when the 2008 Olympics rolled around, she listed her birth date as January 23rd, 1986. That meant at the time she competed in 2000, she had only been 14 years old, well under the minimum age requirement. Her bronze medal was stripped and given to the U.S., but the evidence suggests that hers isn't the only such story. There were further investigations into the Chinese women's gymnastics teams in 2008, and although those girls were ultimately found to be old enough to compete, USA Gymnastics made it very clear that they doubted the verdict and condemned the pressure put on preteen girls to not only compete, but to lie about their age to do so. 
Keen O'Connor was one of the youngest show jumpers in Ireland at the time he rode Waterford Crystal at the Athens Olympics in 2004. I mean, I've been lucky. I've had some great horses, some great results. O'Connor took the gold medal, but didn't quite take it home when tests on Waterford crystals came back positive for two substances commonly used in humans as antipsychotics. O'Connor and his team said that yes, they'd given the horse the drugs as a sedative to keep him calm while he had been recovering from an injury, and it was when they appealed for a retest that things got really weird. That, says the Irish Times, is when someone intercepted the sample being sent for retesting, signed for it, then vanished. Things got even more complicated when there was a break-in at the Irish Equestrian Federation, and some uncomfortable files were released to the public. Namely, it was proof that another of O'Connor's horses had also tested positive for doping. That kicked off a whole media frenzy, and ultimately, he went through with his appeal even though there could be no retest. While the committee agreed that yes, they had given the horse the drugs in enough time that they should have been cleared out of his system by the Olympics, the bottom line was, they hadn't. As a result, O'Connor was stripped of his gold medal. Here's something of a complicated tale, and it starts with the 2004 Athens Olympics. That's when the International Olympic Committee handed down sanctions to Colombian cyclist Maria Luisa Calle Williams. Williams had a drug test come back positive for a banned substance called heptaminol, and as a result, she was stripped of the bronze medal she had won in the women's points race. That's by no means the end of the story, and Williams wholeheartedly denied ever taking any such substance. The New York Times later reported that Kaye Williams had appealed the ruling, stating that she had taken some headache medication that had resulted in a false positive for the banned substance. The Court of Arbitration for Sport ultimately agreed, and the bronze, which had been given to U.S. cyclist Erin Mirabella, was taken away from her and returned. Now, the footnote to the whole saga, in 2015, Kaye was competing at Toronto's Pan American Games when her drug test came back positive for another prohibited substance. Cycling News said she was given a four-year ban. The very first Olympic medal for snowboarding was awarded at the 1998 Winter Olympics in Nagano, and then it was promptly removed when gold medalist Ross Rebliati's drug test came back positive for marijuana. According to the Washington Post, Rebliati said that he personally hadn't smoked marijuana since April of the previous year. However, when friends had a pre-Olympics going away party for him, some of them had been smoking. He was in the room, and that's how it had gotten into his system. When it came time for the IOC to vote on whether he'd be handed a disqualification or just a slap on the wrist, it was pretty close. At the time, there were no specific limits on marijuana use, and while it wasn't listed as performance enhancing, it was controversial because it was said to be used to calm nerves. The ban actually didn't last long and was overturned before he even had a chance to give the medal back. The most important thing was to have the support of uh, our, my country and uh, my friends, my family. But still, that's not the end of the story. Rebliati later said, Cannabis was seen as being for losers and lazy stoners. I became a source of entertainment, a joke. He went on to embrace it, though. With Canada's legalization of weed, he has since launched his own cannabis lifestyle brand called Legacy. The Smithsonian calls Jim Thorpe the greatest American Olympian of all time, but it's not a sentiment that's reflected in any official records. Why? It's a weird story. Thorpe, who was a Sac and Fox Native American who grew up hunting, riding, and working in what was then the Oklahoma Territory, famously broke a high school high jump record when he hopped over a bar set above his own height in work clothes. I think Jim Thorpe represents a lot of the American myth. When it came to the Olympics, Thorpe dominated in both the decathlon and pentathlon. That includes events like the Mile Run, which incidentally, he won wearing unmatched shoes and after competing in nine other events in less than 48 hours. Then, in 1912, six months after the competition, the IOC stripped Thorpe of his medals. Why? A few years prior, he had spent a season as a minor league ball player. The Olympics were only for amateurs, and that meant the $25 he'd made had made him ineligible. In spite of rules stating that Olympic medals could only be challenged for 30 days after competition, his medals were revoked. In spite of a massive movement to see the records change and the medals go back to Thorpe, the New York Times says that things still aren't right. In 1982, the IOC awarded him posthumous gold medals that came with a massive catch. The medals were his, but the official records and results of the Olympics he absolutely owned weren't going to be changed. 
So let's say you're traveling abroad and feeling kind of sick, so you grab some Vicks nasal spray. It's an easy decision that's definitely not going to get anyone in trouble, right? That's what the British skier Alan Baxter thought when he competed in the 2002 Olympics in Salt Lake City. According to The Telegraph, his bronze in the slalom made him the only Brit to place in the top three in any alpine skiing event. It was short-lived, though, when he tested positive for methamphetamine. He was shocked, but a closer look at what he bought in a U.S. store made it pretty clear what had happened. In the U.K., Vicks nasal inhalers contain Siberian pine oil, camphor, and menthol as their active ingredients. In the U.S., however, the active ingredient is something called levmetaphetamine. He'd picked up an inhaler thinking it was the same completely inoffensive thing he was used to, but he found out the hard way that wasn't the case at all. Baxter appealed, and while the Court of Arbitration for Sport found him to be, quote, sincere and honest, and someone who never intended to obtain a competitive advantage in the race, they still ruled against Baxter and refused to give his medal back. Baxter later said that he was relieved to have at least been cleared of cheating and added that he hoped the rules would eventually change. Lance Armstrong's story is the stuff of legend. He was only 25 when he was diagnosed with testicular cancer, and post-treatment, he returned to the cycling world to take title after title. It wasn't long, however, before rumors of doping started circulating. Armstrong denied it until 2013, when he came clean during an interview with Oprah. Yes or no, did you ever take banned substances to enhance your cycling performance? Yes. The IOC immediately stripped Armstrong of his bronze medal from the 2000 Sydney Olympics, and it was almost as fast as the International Cycling Union took away his Tour de France honors too. It turned out that was just the beginning of the fall. Things only got worse when the United States Anti-Doping Agency released findings that not only had Armstrong been taking a Molotov cocktail of performance-enhancing drugs, but he'd been, quote, ruthlessly pressuring his teammates to do the same. The report included the insane lengths he had gone to, including things like turning hotel rooms into blood transfusion centers. A total of 26 people, including 11 of his former teammates, testified, and it led to the unfolding of a scandal that the USADA called the most sophisticated, personalized, and successful doping program that sport has ever seen. After Armstrong was stripped of his medal, NPR says it took him eight months to return it. The 2004 Athens Olympics set a record of their own. According to the Los Angeles Times, they were the first Olympic Games where more than one track and field competitor lost a medal for doping. But here's the thing, Hungarian discus thrower Robert Fazikas didn't actually test positive for drugs. He wasn't tested at all, because he struggled with giving a urine sample. Why? Because IOC rules dictate it's something that has to be done in front of witnesses. That's something that not many places include in the list of things you'll have to go through to compete in the Olympics. The IOC hinted at the fact they firmly believed that Fazekas couldn't fill the cup in front of onlookers because he knew he was going to fail and wanted to carry in a clean sample to submit instead. For his first sample, he produced just a third of the required amount, and when it came time to give a second, he outright refused. In the end, Fazekas was disqualified. His gold medal went to the next in line. A book published in 2012 by author Richard Moore called the men's 100-meter race at the 1988 Olympics the, quote, dirtiest race in history, because out of the eight finalists, six would see their careers later tarnished by doping scandals. For one, gold medal winner Ben Johnson, it didn't take long at all. After Johnson won, he took part in a press conference where, in hindsight, he probably shouldn't have declared, this world record will last 50 years, maybe 100. A gold medal, that's something no one can take away from you. It turned out that when your drug test comes back positive for steroid use, they absolutely can take that gold medal away. And they did. Johnson, it turned out, had been using steroids for seven years by the time he competed. His trainer had started him on them saying that everyone was using, and it just leveled the playing field. It was so rampant that the area outside of the practice field at the 1987 World Championships was described by Moore as a, quote, drugs den. And it's pretty shocking that at the time, most of the IOC was kind of indifferent about it. Even more shocking has been Johnson's beliefs about the whole thing, which could be summed up with the idea that it's not a big deal. Johnson said, regardless what the IOC thinks, it's definitely the best race ever run. You only cheat if no one else was not doing it. Several Olympians have had their medals stripped because of poor sportsmanship. So let's start with unified team weightlifter Ibrahim Samadov. 
During the 1992 competition, he had officially tied with the other Polish and Greek athletes. However, since he weighed just a tenth of a pound more than they did, he was deemed to have an advantage and was given the bronze. When it came time for them to head to the podium, Samadov threw his medal on the ground and stormed off. In spite of a later apology, Samadov was stripped of his Olympic medal. Then, in 2008, Ara Abrahamian tossed his bronze medal aside after placing third for Sweden. He made it very clear how unhappy he was, saying, I don't care about this medal. I wanted gold. I consider this Olympics a failure. Abrahamian condemned his placement at third as, quote, totally unjustified and both he and his coach claimed politics had heavily influenced the judge's decision. He announced his retirement from wrestling at the same time, but the IOC still included a ban with the removal of his medal. By the time Antonio Pettigrew was stripped of his Olympic medal, The Guardian says that his career was already over. That didn't take away the shame, though, and Pettigrew became embroiled in a massive scandal, despite the fact that he didn't have a single positive drug test on his record. Pettigrew's coach was Trevor Graham, and in 2008, Graham found himself in court over accusations regarding some very unsportsmanlike conduct. Pettigrew was one of the athletes subpoenaed to testify and admitted that he had been taking human growth hormone drugs on Graham's instructions. The time frame he gave was 1997 to 2001, and that led to the removal of all his titles during that period, including a gold medal in the 4x400 relay in 2000 Sydney Olympics. He wasn't the only one who had his medal taken away, and the admission nullified the results for the rest of his team as well. However, it's also worth noting that many of them had already been sanctioned for other doping instances, but not in 2000. Pettigrew later said, I want to play a role in teaching people, especially young athletes, to know that the negatives far, far outweigh the benefits these substances may give you. Two years later, Pettigrew's body was discovered in his car. ESPN says that his death was ruled a suicide. If you or anyone you know is having suicidal thoughts, please call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 1-800-273-TALK-8255.